Hello, everyone. My name is Chad Stadden, and I'm Professor of Resource Economics and Environmental Policy at the University of the West of England. And in this lecture, I'd like to tell you about some of the exciting things we are doing as geographers to help solve the world's water problems. But before I do that, let me tell you just a little bit about me. I took my PhD in 1996 at the University of Kentucky in the United States for research on water management in post-communist Bulgaria, where I lived for a year whilst on a Canadian government scholarship. To date, I have over 100 peer-reviewed publications focusing on a number of subjects, including resilience in water systems, the relationships between water and energy, or what we call the water energy nexus, urban water histories, telling the stories about how cities like Bristol, Vancouver, Beijing, and Durban have come to develop their urban water systems. I've also published on theoretical questions related to the political ecology, economics, and actor network theory dimensions of water supply systems. And I've also published on what we call off-grid or non-network water systems in the developing nations of the Global South, and it is on this last point that this lecture mostly dwells. I have been Professor of Resource Economics and Policy since 2013, and I'm also Director of the International Water Security Network, a global network of multidisciplinary water scholars focusing on key water challenges. This is the website for the network, which can be easily found at watersecuritynetwork.org, and I encourage you to have a look at the wealth of informative materials on the website describing different aspects of our work in more than two dozen locations around the world. This presentation has three main parts. In the first, I'll talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, a set of globally agreed targets for achieving sustainable development objectives in different domains, including water. In the second part of the presentation, I'll talk about how we measure progress towards achieving the water-related SDGs. And in the third part of the presentation, I will talk about specific research currently underway in the far southwest of Uganda, which brings all of the theoretical work around measuring sustainable development progress together. As I suspect many listeners know, the current period is defined by global attempts to achieve 17 interrelated sustainable development goals, ranging from sustainable development goal number one, no poverty, through to sustainable development goal number 17 that talks about partnerships. The goal that most immediately interests me and my team is sustainable development goal or SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. This SDG is the SDG that includes targets around achieving clean water and improved access to water supply, but also better water management and better sanitation services. So we see, if we look inside SDG 6, that there are a number of targets, 6.1 to 6.4, and a number of indicators by which we'll know we're moving towards those achieving those targets, including 6.1.1, the proportion of the population using something called safely managed drinking water services. In fact, 6.1.1 and 6.4.2 tend to be the two key indicators that my team focuses on from the SDG indicator set. But of course, it's immediately obvious that SDG 6 is linked inextricably to other sustainable development goals. The more we progress towards SDG 6.1, clean water supply and access, the more we find we're also contributing to SDG 5, gender equality, 
because it's a common feature of the work we do in the Global South that it is women and girls who tend to do most of the water work. Therefore, if we can improve access to clean and safe water, we are at the same time improving the life chances of girls and women, and therefore progressing SDG 5 goals. And again, SDG 4 is very important because one of the ways we progress towards SDG 6, and indeed any other SDG, is through capacity building, through helping build human capital, that bank of knowledge and skills in local communities that can be used to address water challenges, food challenges, infrastructure challenges, any kinds of challenges. So in fact, all of the SDGs are ultimately linked. So we may say fairly that although we tend to focus on SDG 6, we're actually working across the broad spectrum of all 17 SDGs, if you take the time to look at the interlinkages between SDGs carefully enough. But the SDGs, although they're high level and important goals, don't quite tell us enough about how we can measure progress, what kinds of progress are actually important in this context. So we need other tools to help us measure relative levels of water security at the national, basin, community, household, and other scales. Now there are lots of numbers out there. A simple Google search using a search term like uh, water security indicators or metrics would reveal that you've got hydrological indicators that talk about how much water may or may not be available in a river basin. Governments always publish national level data that suggest what water balance, the balance between supply of water and demand for it, looks like at the national level. Some NGOs and some district or provincial or state level government authorities will sometimes publish water poverty indices which are attempts to measure how many households suffer from water scarcity or water insecurity. And of course, there's a great deal of work coming out of public health, looking at individual and molecular scale, uh, water and hydration, water and health, uh, water in the biophysical world relationships. What tends to be missing, however, are ways of measuring water security at the household level which, when you finally get around to thinking about it, is odd, because it's at the household level where water abundance or poverty is most keenly felt. Water poverty doesn't make palpable or tangible sense at the community, state, or national scales. It's in households that water poverty is most keenly felt. And yet there are very few indices that actually measure household scale, water, abundance, or poverty. Within our team, we've looked at the different kinds of water supply or water security or water sustainability indices that are available. And again, you find that there are a great many of them, but relatively few focus on the scale of analysis we're interested in, the household, and the kinds of water security experience we're interested in. And so four years ago, I became involved in the Household Water Insecurity Experiences Research Coordination Network. Our initial mission was to develop the world's first cross-culturally validated way of measuring household scale water insecurity. A quantitative tool based on 12 survey questions that would allow us to compare sites in different parts of the world and also to compare how one site develops over time if we were to apply the HWISE indicator say this year and then five years from now we would hope as a result of our efforts to find that in five years, levels of water insecurity as measured by the HWISE index are much improved. 
The HY's Research Coordination Network is governed by a Global Governance Committee, and I sit on that committee alongside uh, other kinds of specialists from geography, anthropology, public health, nutrition studies. And together we work to make the HY's indicator set as robust and widely applied as possible. Our initial data set, collected between 2016 and 2018, covered 29 sites in 23 countries, and in each site we collected at least 250 household surveys to collect household water insecurity data. And with that data, we use sophisticated item reduction statistical techniques to determine which are the key questions you need to ask anywhere on earth in order to learn what you need to learn about household level water insecurity. And remember, the point of doing this is to help us address sustainable development goal number six, abundant and safe water access for everyone on earth. These are the 12 items that came out of our work between 2016 and 2018. Now, interestingly, many of these questions are not about the absolute or physical presence or absence of water. They're about how householders experience water. So the water may or may not be physically present, but what matters is how the householders experience it. So for example, the first question in the list here asks, how often in the last month have you or anyone else in your household been worried that you would not have enough water for all of your household needs? To ask a householder whether or not they've been worried is to ask, not to ask about a physical characteristic. It's to ask about what we call emotion or affect. How does someone feel about something? And there are other questions that are similarly affective, including how often in the last month have you or anyone else in your household felt angry about your water situation? And how often in the last month have you or anyone else in your household felt ashamed, excluded or stigmatized due to problems with water? Because for example, you face the prospect of having to send your children to school dirty. It turns out when you crunch all the numbers from all the field sites we studied around the world, these emotional, affective domain questions are very explanatory. Much more explanatory than just asking a hydrologist to tell you how much water is in the lake or how much flow is in the river. And when you think about it, it's perhaps not that surprising that these emotional, affective domain questions would be so explanatory. Because if household respondents were not experiencing water insecurity, they would not be worried, angry, or ashamed, because it would follow that they would have sufficient water in order to uh, fend away those negative emotions. So interestingly, when we went to press in the British Medical Journal in 2019 with the results of the worldwide HY survey initiative, one of the findings that got the most discussion was the finding that these questions about emotional state and experience were so powerful compared with the more supposedly objective questions about how much water is there locally for washing or cooking uh, or cleaning functions. For example, when we applied the Household Water and Security Index in Accra, Ghana, in Western Africa, we found that 48% of respondents worried about not having enough water. 48%, very nearly half of the 250 households we talked to, had worried in the previous month about not having enough water. That's a powerful statistic all by itself, even if you know nothing else about Ghanaian water issues. Almost one quarter in the previous 30 days 
had drunk water that they thought was unsafe. One-fifth had changed what was eaten in the household due to the water situation, perhaps shifting to some kind of food that did not require as much water. And almost a quarter had had water problems that prevented them earning money, either directly through not being uh, able to wash or present themselves appropriately, or indirectly through not being able to apply water to household agriculture. And of course, all of these dimensions of water insecurity have impacts on different members of the household in different ways. So for example, the impact of water insecurity on infants and children, particularly during what public health practitioners and researchers call the first thousand days, can have lifelong effects. We collected uh, data from 29 sites, as I've mentioned, and in summary form, this is what the data tends to look like. This is a set of bar charts that shows the relative presence or absence of a given dimension of water insecurity, including, for example, the, the number of times in the last 30 days that respondents were upset or angry, felt ashamed, uh, had no water whatsoever, uh, etc. And put all together, the results look a bit like this. Of course, it's quite difficult to really tease out the differences between different locations at this global scale. So subsequent to publishing the data sets in the British Medical Journal last year, we have started to unpack particular dimensions of water insecurity. For example, we've looked at the extent to which the overall HWISE score along the x-axis here, and it, which varies between 0 and 36, varies depending on where a household gets its drinking or non-drinking water. And in this representation, you can see what we call a set of box and whiskers, box and whisker plots, that show that, for example, if you depend on protected springs, one of the categories in the middle of the box and whisker plot, or um, bagged or sachet water, you are likely to report a lower level of household water insecurity than if you depend on unprotected springs, dug wells, or other kinds of surface waters. And that stands to reason. But we've also explored the data in other ways. This chart looks quite complicated and it would take a while to begin to really unpack what it's telling us. But in a nutshell, what it asks is, what does the HWISE data set tell us about how ability to pay for water in cash affects uh, the reported household water insecurity score? Or to put it in other words, is it possible to buy your way out of water insecurity? At least in any of the 29 sites in 23 countries where we applied the survey up to 2018. This research was published earlier in 2020 in this paper, which appears in the journal Science of the Total Environment. And if anyone is interested and you want to find this paper, all you need to do is cut and paste this uh, HTTP address into your browser and you will be taken straight to the journal article itself in which this table appears. But let me tell you a little bit about how this table works. It reports three different ways of trying to statistically portray the relationship between cash expenditures as reported in the HWISE survey data and household water insecurity. And what all three models tended to find is that there was no strong tendency for higher income, higher expenditure households in these locations to report lower water insecurity. In other words, these households were not telling us 
that they could buy their way out of water insecurity. We also included other independent variables within the models, including age of respondent, gender of respondent, the number of children in the household, the amount of water storage, the total water storage, um, and whether or not the household was rural or urban. But remember, we got into this business because we were primarily interested in helping understand progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 6, and in particular, Sustainable Development Goal 6.1. By 2030, we want to help achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. Responsibility for helping the nations of the world progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 6 falls primarily with a group called the Joint Monitoring Panel, which is comprised of the World Health Organization and UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Educational Fund, which works together to try and collect together the data necessary to help determine which nations are moving towards their SDG 6 targets. However, the JMP, because it operates at the international scale and relies primarily on data collected by national governments, frequently is unable to draw on high quality, high resolution household experiential data. Although there are some other research initiatives a little bit like HWISE, there are no initiatives that, like HWISE, have developed a globally comparative way of measuring household water insecurity through a small number of easily applied and reliable survey questions. What we've tended to find when we put HWISE results up against JMP results is that HWISE seems to describe more of the experience of household water insecurity than the basic joint monitoring panel measures. And because of this, we are increasingly working with organizations such as Oxfam, Water Witness International, Action Against Hunger, the Gallup World Poll, and the MIX, the Multiple Indicator Cluster Surveys Initiative, all of whom have decided that the HWISE questions provide valuable information for their ongoing attempts to monitor SDG 6 progress. Well, all of that is quite theoretical. Now let's take it out into the field. Let me tell you about some of the exciting SDG 6 facing work our team from the University of the West of England has been involved in over the last 10 years or so. I'll focus on one of our study uh, areas in southwestern Uganda, although we also work in other parts of Africa, South America, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. The field site I'd like to talk about here is located in the far southwestern corner of the East African nation of Uganda. In fact, Kisoro District is about as far southwest as you can go in Uganda without being in either the Democratic Republic of Congo to the west or Rwanda to the south. It is a relatively mountainous region, in fact nestled in the Virunga Mountains that form the border zone between DRC, Rwanda and Uganda. It experiences two periods of monsoonal rain uh, in the spring and in the late summer, early autumn. So it receives a considerable amount of rainfall, perhaps as much as a meter and a half or more per year. 
And yet, even by JMP measures, which I've already spoken about in this lecture, there is relatively little water services provision. These bar charts show dependence on different kinds of water in all Uganda and rural Uganda. We'll focus on rural Uganda because Kisoro district is predominantly rural. And what this uh, bottom triplet of bar charts is showing is that between the year 2000 and the year 2015, there was an improvement in levels of basic water service, but more than half the population of the areas still depended on limited or unimproved water services. So progress, even according to JMP statistics, has been relatively slow towards SDG 6. And in fact, this is what water services tend to look like in Kisoro district. From the upper left, we see people collecting water from a, a springs source called Chuho near the town of Kisoro. And you can see that the water people are collecting is not particularly clean. It looks turbid or muddy, and that potentially hides or harbors various kinds of chemical or microbiological pollutant. You can also see that people are collecting water in 5 to 20 liter jerry cans, plastic containers that they dip into the water, let them fill, and then carry home for domestic use. The containers themselves, as you can see, are quite variable in cleanliness and quality, and so one might fairly wonder if, even if the water that goes into the container is clean, what happens to it when it encounters a container itself that may not be clean? In the upper right, you see the queue that's forming for the source at upper left, and people will often arrive early in the day, put their jerry cans down in the queue, and leave a small child to watch the jerry can and move it along the queue as the queue progresses in the course of the day. In the lower right, you see a young woman collecting water from a moving water source. And this is something that we often don't think about when we're focusing on water and water security. Moving water can be dangerous, and one needs to wonder how safe it is to wade into moving water sources to collect the water that your family needs. And then in the lower right, you can see that people are using available water for a number of different purposes which seem incompatible. The men are washing their bikes, locally known as bodabodas, in the same water that the women are collecting for household use. Let me ask you, would you like to drink the water that's just been used to clean a motorcycle engine? In July of 2019, my team applied the HYS questions to a selection of households within Kisoro District, and we discovered that relative levels of household water insecurity are high across the board. In other words, only households reporting dependence on piped water reported a level of HYS household water insecurity lower than 10. Remember, it's a scale that goes from zero to 36. And as a rule of thumb, if a household reports water insecurity greater than about 10, we consider it relatively water insecure. So you can see that our respondents in Kisoro District are relatively water insecure across the board. Similarly, if you represent household water insecurity um, relative to the number of months households are reporting being water insecure, you can see that the more months a household reports water insecurity, the higher its overall water insecurity score. And that, you'll say, presumably follows quite logically. This box and whisker plot shows the relationship visually between HY score and socioeconomic status. With low status at the top and high status at the bottom, 
And what's interesting about this is that both low and high status households at both extremes are reporting higher water insecurity than, if you like, the middle ranked households. This is a slightly counterintuitive finding, and it's been the subject of future work when we're able to get back to the field study site, probably in summer 2021. But water insecurity is not just about quantities of water of sufficient quality, it's also about safety of access. A few slides ago, I noted that dipping uh, jerry cans into moving water into rivers poses hazards to the health and safety of the person doing the collecting. Similarly, in some so-called improved water sources, such as the spring water collection point in the photo on left, you can see that there are physical hazards involved in accessing this water collection point, as well as the water collection point being relatively inadequate. So over the years, my team has done work not just to improve the quantity and quality of water provided, but to improve the safety of access. And that's what we're showing you in the photo on right. Uh, this is what the same site as left looked like after we had done quite a lot of basic civil engineering to improve safety of access for users. Something else that might be less apparent involves the fenced off area above the water collection point. Because this water collection point is largely about groundwater and groundwater collection, it was important to keep grazing animals um, off that particular area of land to help preserve water quality because the last thing you want uh, is animal urine and feces residue percolating into the soil and contaminating the near surface groundwater flows that people are drawing on at the pipe outlet. A few years ago some UE students who came to our field site in Kisora, Uganda, produced an 11 minute video that wonderfully describes the work we do in the region. I won't play it for you now. I'll invite you, if you're interested, to go back uh, to the slide deck uh, or follow the YouTube link and enjoy the video at a later time. Every summer, we take UE staff and students to places like Kisora, Uganda, to help us progress the work of improving water security in places like Uganda. In the upper central picture, you see our water innovation lab, where we do water quality analysis and where we do uh, basic technology development related to helping people collect water safely using appropriate technologies and as you'll see a little bit later on, ensure that that water that is collected is of an acceptable quality to be safely consumed. Because southwestern Uganda is sitting on top of a largely volcanic geology, solving water problems is not as simple as simply drilling wells. Rather, Households tend to depend on rainwater collection. So the idea is you use your roof area as a collecting space, divert the runoff off the roof into an above ground ferro cement or plastic collection tank. And over the years, we've done quite a lot of work to help understand the performance of these rainwater harvesting systems, both Quantitatively, do they collect enough water? And qualitatively, is that water of acceptable quality? We have also looked at the civil engineering of the assets themselves. In other words, are they built in such a way that they will provide years of reliable service? Or are there systematic flaws or faults that need to be addressed? Civil engineering students from the Department for Geography and Environmental Management have focused, for example, on the way in which concrete is used in these ferro-concrete tank structures and how the curing of that concrete 
may either suppress and inhibit or promote cracking. Obviously, if you're in the business of collecting water in tanks, you don't want cracks. Cracks are bad. So it's important that we understand why cracks happen and how we can change the way these tanks are constructed and maintained to minimize the amount of tank cracking. There are lots of different reasons why tanks can crack to do with the curing of the, the concrete at the point of construction, chemical attack, uh, damage due to ground shifts or seasonal temperature movement, um, corrosion of the iron superstructure within the tank itself, And we're also interested in understanding the quality of the water that's collected within these tanks. Quality can be understood in a number of ways. We can think about quality in terms of the physical properties of the water, in terms of its conductivity, how easily it conducts electricity, its turbidity, which I mentioned before, Turbidity is a term we use to describe how muddy or cloudy water is. Its pH, the extent to which it's relatively acid or alkaline. And the extent to which it contains certain kinds of chemical constituents, which may be correlated with health impacts such as phosphates, nitrates, nitrites, and iron. In various modules on our human and geography degree programs, we teach students why these different indicators are important and how to understand them. How to understand physical chemical water quality parameters, microbiological water quality parameters, etc. I'm going to focus on microbiology. In 2018, we started assessing microbiological quality of stored rainwater by going out to the more than 400 tanks within Kisoro District and taking samples of water from a selection of tanks, bringing it back to our field lab and using agar plate-based uh, uh, assessment techniques to assess total coliforms and fecal coliforms. In other words, the amount of microbiological activity of a potentially harmful nature that was manifested in those sampled water tanks. In the table, you can see in the section on the left, the standards for microbiological uh, quality and for uh, World Health Organization standards for drinking water, the standard is zero levels of total coliforms and fecal coliforms. For natural potable water sources, Ugandan law will allow up to 10 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. In treated water, uh, perhaps unexpectedly, the, the level is the same as the World Health Organization levels, zero. We collected rainwater harvesting tank samples, untreated surface water tank samples, and treated water samples. With those ends, 34 samples from harvest, uh, rainwater harvesting tank systems, nine samples from untreated surface water, and five samples from treated piped water sources. And what we found was rainwater samples were significantly contaminated by both total coliform and fecal coliform measures, with at least 50% of samples above the World Health Organization uh, standards. Un untreated surface waters were even more commonly contaminated microbiologically. And perhaps surprisingly, even treated piped water supplies were fairly frequently found to be microbiologically suspect. So, what do you do about it? Over 10 years working in Kisoro District, 
we've done a lot of work to help communities build ferro-cement tanks for collecting rainwater. By collecting rainwater during the rainy seasons, of which there are two in southwestern Uganda, households have a chance of collecting at the household enough water to carry them through all or most of the dry seasons. But we've also done work to understand the quality of the water that they're collecting, and we found that a lot of that water is microbiologically suspect. So in the last few years, we've launched new work focusing on how can we help these households quality assure the water that they're using. One of the sustainable technologies that we've been working with over the last year or so is what's called ceramic pot filtration. Nothing more or less than an unglazed ceramic flower pot, if you will. So imagine a flower pot with no drainage hole in the bottom, so it's integral, and it is kiln dried, but it's not glazed. That ceramic pot will leak. If it leaks at an appropriate rate to provide a throughput of something like one or two liters per 30 or 60 minute period, there is a measurable filtration effect. So the work that we've been doing in 2019 and early 2020, immediately prior to lockdown, focused on reproducing in the lab at UWE some of the results that other researchers have found elsewhere in the world, balancing off how fast water flows through one of these leaky flower pots and the treatment effect that's achieved. And here you can see on the right four different formulas for making a ceramic pot filter. Filter A actually didn't have a flow rate at all. It was almost perfectly sealed. Filters B and C had flow rates that were acceptable. They were up to 350 or approaching 400 milliliters per time step. Filter D was um, less prolific than that. And of course, we're also interested not just in how fast water flows through these filters, but what is the treatment effect? So in this box and whisker plot, we can see there is a treatment effect reducing uh, the amount of colony forming units in input water, described as pond water here, and the output water as it comes through filters B and C. These turned out to be the filters that were really interesting because they combined the best balance of flow rate and treatment effect. And the reason why they do that is because these pots are microporous. So what you see here are scanning electron microscope images showing cross sections of the pots themselves. And it's the rugosities, the porosities of the pots that do the filtration work through a combination of processes that are very physical, they're microporous, they're also uh, chemical in terms of adhesion and chemical interactions between the pollutants and the pot filters and they're also microbiological. One of the UE students who came to Kisoro with us in the summer of 2019 has recently completed a wonderful final year project describing the effectiveness of different kinds of ceramic pot filters. Of course, our 2020 field season was, had to be cancelled due to coronavirus, but had we been able to go in 2020, we would have focused on those four types of tasks. Task set one, thinking about streamlining um, chemical and microbiological testing of water in the field using different analytical techniques, continuing to uh, progress towards a full survey run on all 220 uh, tanks within the Diocese of Muhiburo Water and Sanitation Program system. Task two, looking at pre and post installation HWISE results at 
sites within the district that have received new water infrastructure. So using the HWISE indicator set to measure how much improvement in household water security has been created by building things like gravity supply schemes or additional community scale rainwater harvesting. Task three was going to move from the lab to the field, our testing of ceramic point of use water filters versus other water quality assurance technology. And task set four involved further work looking at thermal cracking in rainwater harvesting tanks. All of those plans, of course, were put on hold for this past field season, but we're hoping to be back in the season with a full team of UE staff and students in July and August 2021 to pick up the suspended work program. In this lecture, I've tried to explain to you some of the work that researchers at UWE, led by myself, have been undertaking over the last decade to help address Sustainable Development Goal number six, universal access to safe and sufficient quantities of water for everyone on Earth. In order to do that, we've had to design a way of measuring progress that works at the household scale, rather than relying on national statistics. And we focused the work on particular field locations in East Africa, South America, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. I hope you're excited to learn more about these different dimensions of global water security challenges. And if you'd like to learn more, follow those links to watersecuritynetwork.org, subscribe to our Twitter feed, where we report on new publications and new achievements as they happen, or email me or my colleagues to learn more directly. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. Have a great day.